uh, we talk about as we talk about fleet electrification. Um, now, I want to show you really quickly what we're going to do today, just so you can follow along. Um, I'm going to start with telling you just a tiny little bit about the Mobility House. Ron already um, did a great job um, telling you what we do. I'd like to add a little bit more context so you know the perspective that I can bring um, to um, you know this topic and how we think about it. Um, right after that, I'd like to just very quickly talk about what is actually smart charging, just so we have the same definition of it, um, you know, and are all clear on the terms um, and what is meant by that. And then number three, I think is the most important point here in this presentation and probably what you're most interested in. Uh, we're going to look at a case study on, you know, what simulation can do ahead of time and specifically what it can do. Uh, to lower demand charges, to lower dramatically the utility bill from fleet charging, and also what that means for utility upgrades and how to size them. And then number four, um, just a few recommendations um, on, um, you know, from our experience at the Mobility House, what we would think, you know, wherever you are in the, in the uh, different phases of fleet electrification, you know, what you can do right now, what um, questions we would recommend you look at um, right now and kind of giving you a little bit of a um, more actionable outlook um, after we've been just like, you know, looking at the case study and then looking what that can actually do for you. All right. So with that, let's jump right in. Um, who is the Mobility House? Who are we? So as just mentioned, um, you know, we've been the uh, leader in uh, smart charging since 2009. Um, so at this point, I think that's 14 years. Um, specifically, we've helped many fleets around the world um, in their transition to electric vehicles. Um, and on the left here is kind of the um, really the key competence that we can bring to that. So how uh, can fleets leverage smart charging, um, you know, to uh, lower their uh, their ongoing costs and their their capital costs as well, right? We're also a leader in vehicle to grid integration, specifically uh, vehicle uh, to grid, um, which is something that will be um, will become exponentially more important um, in the following years. Something that right now is still something to look at, but maybe not necessarily for, for most of the fleets that might be joining this, this webinar, something that is in the near future. But it's good that it's, you know, that's something that you can think about. Um, stationary storage is another one of our segments where we can bring a lot of expertise. And finally, and Ron had already mentioned it, uh, we have kind of a suite of smart tools that can be leveraged for fleets um, to look ahead of time you know, what should be considered, how can I best plan the fleet electrification to really go about it in the smartest way possible, lowest cost possible, right? Planning for scale from the beginning on without having to build out, you know, a whole depot right at the beginning, but in phases, thinking about the last phase as we start the first phase. So really kind of a smart approach. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I already mentioned it a little bit. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about our experience and what we've learned from our customers here. We can see Newflyer here on the left-hand side. Um, they use our system to ensure that charging at uh, the transits that they work with um, is as seamless as possible. Um, we take great pride in being a... Um, agnostic player when it comes to manufacturers, meaning that um, no fleet should ever be locked in into the charging hardware from any one provider, um, which is why we work closely with all open standard charging hardware providers that there are on the market in North America. Um, we've helped transits such as uh, Montgomery County transits, transit to have a electric fleet that can be charged from a full-on microgrid, um, that the microgrid um, is something that is um, supplied by our partner Alpha Structure, um, and, but we are able to help, help them handle the charging side of things. Um, the Austrian International Post um, is a customer 
where um, I'm happy to share some learnings from them because they have, you know, a multi hundred depot operation. So um, there is there's just certain learnings uh, that there are when you do the the electrification at 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 um, full scale. Um, we've already mentioned a couple of school districts that we work with. Um, school buses lend themselves very well to electrification, um, which is um, something that we've been helping our um, school customers um, navigate as easy as possible. Um, and, you know, there's many, many more actors that we've worked work with in the industry that we've been learning from from the uh, in the industry that are some of them are here but I'm not going to go through all of them um because I want to be mindful of your time now um since um I've been able to provide a little bit of background on who we are at the mobility house um I'd like to talk about what smart charging actually is and this is a buzzword that has been used in the industry more and more in different, um, meaning different ways. And so I want to be clear, you know, how smart charging should be defined and what the core competency of it really is. Now, if we're talking smart charging, um, the core of it really is charging and energy management. And you'll hear me use this phrase more and more as we talk you know through this um, in this webinar so i want to be super clear on what is meant there when we talk about charging and energy management there's fundamentally two different sides to it there is the charging and energy management on a side level basically looking at the overall depot um right like what is the energy doing there what is happening on the depot and then there's also you know the charge port level. And I'm uh, deliberate in saying port here because we know there are many different charger companies that offer, you know, depot boxes with different um, amount of dispensers. So there might be, um, you know, a charger with like three different dispensers. And I'm using dispensers and ports here interchange interchangeably because there's other chargers that will have, you know, two different like plugs, ports, you know, in one in one system. So just think of like a charge port as the one that you can actually plug into the, the vehicle. Now, um, going into the site level dimension of charging and energy management, smart charging. First, what is meant by that? And I have a very general graph here um, that I think speaks more than as if I had like, you know, 100 words on this slide. Now we can see here um, the load of charging at a depot, right? And the red load right here um, would be charging unmanaged, right? Like vehicles come back and are plugged in and they're charged right away, not throttled, not controlled, not derated, not managed, nothing, right? And so we can see if we accumulate all that, um, I believe these are... Actually, I'm not 100% sure, but I think these are about five vehicles, chargers at this site, right? And accumulative, we can see where the load at the site is. So um, there is a peak in the morning at about 150 kilowatt and a peak in the afternoon by around 200 kilowatt. Now, what smart char charging and charging energy management can do is managing this load, the cumulative load of all charging at this site, um to you know what to to the end whatever is necessary at the site so at this site it makes sense to bring down the peak load and we've already mentioned demand charges we've already mentioned grid upgrades there's many reasons why you might want to bring down the peak load now charging the energy management at this site would accomplish what's here in blue right so you can see the overall load at this site um is managed um, to be down to 60 watt kilowatt, uh, 67, sorry, kilowatt um, at the peak. So that's what I mean with site level charging and energy management. Here's another example, um, just like adding another complexity, adding another load on site, right? So the gray would be another load on site, for example, a building load, right? Um, that would be on the same feeder as the charging load. Now, um, this is a charging energy management webinar, so we're not going to talk about managing building loads. Let's just assume this building load is, is a given. 
but then we can um, manage the charging load on top of that, right? So the red again would be the unmanaged one and the blue here is the managed charging load. Um, there's other things that could be on site, for example, um, uh, for example, energy storage, for example, um, you know, full on microgrid, other loads, other um, energy related uh, factors on the site that can all be included in the overall managing of the site load. Now, after we have that, if after we get that out of the way, and I should add, actually, if there's any questions, we have a, a Q&A function here in Zoom. So feel free to um, submit any questions and we'll go through them at the end. Um, now we have that out of the way. Let's look at the point level charging and energy management. So maybe look at the slide starting from the left, right? Like, um, yeah, starting from the left. So. On the left here, this like little like industrial control looking thing um, is the smart charging device, right? That is connected to many different chargers. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't fit. It could be connected to like a hundred. They all don't fit on the slide. So let's just work with the six that are right here. And on the um, to these chargers, there are vehicles connected, of course. Now, what charging energy management, smart charging can also do is manage the uh, power that actually goes to every single charger. All this happens in parallel of the side load, right? So the question would always be how much should there be overall cumulatively available for charging? And then the question is how is this distributed to each of the ports? You know, this could be... Um, could be done on very basic information, such as the current vehicle's state of charge. But there's more complexity that could be added. So if we're talking fleet, usually there is a fleet schedule, right? These vehicles have to leave at a certain time. Um, and usually there is a certain required state of charge that these vehicles need to complete their routes. Um, oftentimes that's something like 85% state of charge. So if we look at um, vehicle number one, right? Their departure time would be in two hours. And until then they would need 25% more, um, more um, a higher state of charge, right? Vehicle number two will leave in three hours and they only need 20%, right? So what charging energy management does, it takes all this information and then um, assigns priority classes to each of these vehicles and in turn chargers. Now, I want to be very clear that, um, you know, these priority classes are not something that should be scheduled ahead of time, as in, you know, this vehicle will charge exactly then no matter what. But this is something that happens usually dynamically on a site. It's recalculated uh, every time something on the site changes and reassigned every, every time a parameter changes on the site that could be, um, you know, a new vehicle connecting that could also be, you know, a schedule changing. Um, but either way, there is um, every vehicle and every charger is individually taken into account. Now, what does that mean? Trying to be uh, more specific um, and specifically, you know, also what charging energy management is not. Charging energy management is not a permanent derating of chargers. And that is something that I wanna be very clear about because it sometimes gets confused. So for example, right down here, we would have um, a site with four chargers, right? Um, and what I'm trying to show you here with this graph is that, you know, at 6 a.m., maybe number one uh, of the chargers will get, you know, all the juice that there is on site. You know, a little bit later, you know, something changes on sites, schedules change, something changes, you know, it will reprioritize. And, um, you know, now charger one and two get some juice. And then even later, you know, they all get something. What probably happens here is that the vehicle connected to charger one has a higher state of charge at this point. Um, so it doesn't need quite as much charging power. And then so there's more for the others. But all this could be going dynamically up and down we can see charger two, for example, has zero kilowatt here. At 6.45, it has 30 kilowatt. At 7.20, it, has, it gets 20 kilowatt. So this is all dynamically happening without any one person sitting in a control center and um, you know, scheduling this charging or changing this manually. And that is really the smart part of what we're talking about. 
Now, what actual derating of chargers would mean is that we look at the same site, um, you know, it would be um, determined that um, at this site, um, this should actually be 100 kilowatts. So there's 100 kilowatt at this site, right? And it's determined, okay, every charger, um, let's say these 150 kilowatt chargers can only charge at the charging power of 25 kilowatt. That is it. It can never go over. Now, that is not what charging energy management or smart charging is. That's permanent derating of a charger. And that is exactly what we want to avoid with smart charging and why smart charging is so important. All right. Now that we got that out of the way, um, and again, if you have any questions, um, you know, submit them in the Q&A part and we can talk about them later. Um, I'd love to have this as um, interactive as possible. Um, you know, let's look at, you know, what this smart charging can actually do for fleet electrification. And there's actually a lot that it can do, right? Um, for example, future-proofing a charging depot. That could be um, by allowing multiple charging hardwares to be installed in the future. So starting now with one charger manufacturer, maybe in a few years, it's decided um, that, you know, another manufacturer would be a better fit. Or honestly, you know, if you have to go through an RFP process, you cannot just decide this is the manufacturer that I'm going to be doing all my depots and all charges with. With charging energy management, you could future-proof the charging depot by staying open uh, to different manufacturers. Second here is like, you know, delivering the capital cost savings that is, you know, saving on grid utility upgrades um, that you think you might have needed otherwise. It also allows you to minimize the cost of charging by avoiding demand charges. Um, it can also tremendously increase the reliability of charging at a site by not being dependent on the network connection, meaning that charging can continue optimized as needed, even when there is network outages. Um, it allows the integration of solar or um, energy storage, or maybe even a whole on microgrid on site to the charging. And then of course, there is many benefits of live monitoring of charging operations at the site, to always be in control, to react quickly, um, and also maybe just for data reporting that is necessary. Now, all these are many things that a smart charging can do for you. Um, I've had a hard time limiting myself, but I did. And uh, we're just going to talk uh, in more depth today about the capital cost savings and really the operational cost savings, which um, I think is of most interest um, also in Manitoba as um, you have these high demand charges on, a util on, on your um, utility tariffs. Um, and then, of course, um, there is always an end to how much energy can be, you know, can, can be received at any given charging site. Now, you know, this um, slide is to give you a little bit of an overview and we'll jump right into the uh, case study and example here in just a second. Now, um, thinking, right, like about, um, you know, what, um, I guess, where does the smart charging and charging energy management, I'm using that interchangeably, as you can see, really fit in. Now, this uh, here on the left, we can see a graph on, you know, the cost that could be expected, and this is obviously a generalized um, graphic without smart charging. So, you know, there is on this gray box here, there's a certain cost, capital cost for charging equipment. Um, these are your chargers. Um, then on right under um, design and construction cost, um, which are usually separate, but I've lumped them in here together. And then number one down here is really like the first year of operations. Count into here the utility, the electricity cost for charging, right? Now, smart charging really is the instrument to bring many of these blocks down. And, um, you know, we'll talk about this here in a second if we talk charging hardware first. There is actually a way that with smart charging, you don't need a one-on-one -on -one configuration you might get away with uh, getting a few less chargers than your actual fleet um, 
fleet amount of vehicles, right? Um, the other one is the design and construction. Now, uh, we'll talk about this in a second, how this can be accomplished. With smart charging, um, you know, you can you can really lower um, the utility grid upgrade that you might need from your utility. It depends how much utilities charge for these upgrades. It depends where we are at in the process. In the US, there are more and more utilities that are charging millions of US dollars for these upgrades at this point. And there's other utilities who are not doing upgrades anymore. They have passed upgrades because they are at capacity. And that could, of course, that could, of course, tremendously slow down the, pro uh, the progress in your electrification journey. And then, of course, you know, there's optimized charging the operational cost that could be saved. And just a very quick right, like reminder on what we just talked about, the unmanaged charging, whoops, unmanaged charging and um, the um, managed charging here on the left, unmanaged charging would mean the vehicle starts immediately at the max right, causing the high peak load and demand charges. The charging does not consider the utility tariff and there is no priority given to any vehicle or charger. Smart charging, on the other hand, is um, load balancing, lowering the peak demand. The charging occurs during off-peak hours. Um, there is a certain priority given to different vehicles, and there is certain um, ability to do preconditioning, which is something that would be particularly interesting, actually, in the winter in Manitoba, as the temperatures are really, really uh, low, right? There is a certain power draw from the vehicle, um, for preheating that bus. And that is something that has to be taken into account because that draws actually on the battery. All right, so let's go into the example, right? And what we did here was um, taking a stab at um, how uh, smart charging for Winnipeg Transit's future battery electric transit uh, fleet could look like. So I want to be clear, right? This is a simulation. Um, we'll see here in a second, but it'll assume 105 battery electric buses. Of course, Winnipeg Transit does not have 105 battery electric buses in operation right now. Um, and it takes into account the anticipated schedules for these buses. What we did is um, looked at, you know, how, how would charging look like? What would be the optimized charging strategy? How will this look like? with smart charging and without smart charging and how much uh, will how much should be expected to pay per month you know in on the uh, electricity bill uh, for the charging of these buses and specifically the important part here was to quantify the savings right it's easy to say well we can lower you know the electricity bill by 80% up to 80% right you know, numbers get thrown around very easily. So it's important to see, you know, what, like, actually, what is the number, right? How much will I pay? How much, um, you know, would I pay in either case? Um, yeah. Um, and more specifically, kind of very similar to what I just talked about, these are the very specific questions, right? On the capital side, on the left here, right? What is the minimum number of charges required to charge the buses? sufficiently given the routes. Um, and this can be answered by actually simulating, right? Like how will the charging and bus operations actually look like at this site? The second uh, question on the uh, capital expense side is um, what is the um, maxi maximum load on site um, for the power connection? So it can be designed accordingly. That is usually how many megawatt do I actually need at the site? So I can tell my utility early enough. And then the operational cost, um, it's mostly really, as I just said, how much should I, should, um, in this case, Winnipeg Transit uh, budget uh, per month on uh, paying for the electricity uh, for all these buses. Now, the way that we went about this at the Mobility House is we have a simulation tool that looks at 15 minute charging um, intervals and optimizes accordingly. Um, the tool optimizes around uh, the uh, lowest utility uh, charging cost, 
but also the lowest demand charge. And then again, lowering also the hardware required on site. Now, specifically for Winnipeg Transit, I want to be as transparent as possible. These were the inputs, right? So the buses, of course, every bus has a different battery size and fuel efficiency. Um, we took that for 105, 60 feet battery electric buses. I do believe these were new flyer buses. Um, chargers, uh, their usual rating would be 150 kilowatt chargers. Um, and uh, a one-to-one -one power cabinet to dispenser ratio. So every charger actually will have only one dispenser and that one dispenser will be um, capable of charging up to 150 kilowatt. Of course, it doesn't have to at all times. That exactly is the smart charging that it gets anywhere between zero and 150, 150 kilowatt really. Now, very importantly, the electricity tariff. So in this case, this was Manitoba Hydro General Service Medium commercial tariff. Um, and the reason why the specific um, utility tariff is important here is um, that it will very much depend how high the demand charges are, right? Um, and we want to be able to actually give certain dollar values on the cost of charging per month. And we can't do that if we just use a dummy tariff or something like that. So we use the actual tariff that uh, would be applicable here. I also want to say that um, in different areas, you know, sometimes there are no demand charges. Sometimes there's time of use rates, as in it's cheaper to charge at night than during the day. Not the case in Manitoba, um, because you all have a lot of hydro. Um, so it's really just the demand charge that we have to look at. Time of day, else than that, does not matter, aside, for the route, aside from for the routes, of course. And that's the last part here, the seasonal bus routes. So what do these blocks actually look like for route, uh, for the buses? We, we took that into account for all 105 different buses. What, how long are the routes, right? And what's the arrival time and the departure time of the buses? How long do they actually have time to charge? And the, uh, the length of the routes really tells us, together with the vehicle specs, how much juice does this actually need, does this vehicle need to complete that route? Um, and also still have a certain security margin on top of that. I also want to be clear, we um, usually recommend that a vehicle does not go under 20% uh, percent state of charge. Of course, it could. Um, there is multiple reasons for that to try to avoid that. One is battery degradation. Um, another one is just safety margin, right? If something changes, routes longer, I don't know, weather changes, the consumption is higher. We just, we just at all costs want to avoid any vehicle being stranded anywhere. And we're very conscious of that. So there's always a security margin here on top of what, um, to what we model. Okay, so now I've been uh, talking a lot about um, the assumptions. So let's actually look at the results. How will charging, how would I should say, charging look like with these 150 buses at uh, Winnipeg Transit with and without smart charging? So we can see this here for winter. And this is very similar to what we looked at earlier, but of course here in this, this is the specific case. Now we can see here, this is for a 24 hour interval from um, you know midnight to midnight again, throughout the whole day. The red would be the unmanaged cost. So all 150 buses just plug in when they, when they get there. Um, and the blue is the managed cost, uh, sorry, the managed load here. I also want to be clear, this is in winter. So there's always a difference in winter and summer that is sometimes because the routes are different, but also the ambient temperature makes a big difference in um, you know, what's needed on the preconditioning side, but also on the consumption of the buses, um, you know, things like that. The red dashed line on top of here shows the unmanaged load. And it's a little small, but you might be able to see that this is um, actually 9.5 um, megawatt. That is a lot of power. The gray line shows the current um, constraint on site. So how much power they can actually get on site right now. It's 5.6 megawatt. 
Now, uh, if we want to be um, very specific, I can tell you that the actual um, constraint at the site is a little higher, I think more around six megawatt, but there's something else happening on site, um, a, another building load um, that we didn't um, include here in the modeling. So we lowered that a little bit just to be extra safe. So this is the amount that's available for charging. And right away, we can see that, you know, if this was unmanaged charging for 150, sorry, 105 buses, you know, that would not work with the power that they're getting right now. Um, and, you know, if we look at um, what smart charging could do is it could bring down the peak load to 1.9 megawatt, again, in the winter, which is a little different than in the summer, by spreading out the charging. So I want to be really clear, right, like this simulation took account for every single bus, the route that that bus has to be on. So for example, if that bus leaves at 8 a.m. in the morning, it can't be charging in the middle of, well, if it comes back, but it can't be charging at 9 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. in the morning, right? Um, so that bus is on the route and it has to be charged by them. You can see that there's quite a bit of like midday charging. That is because there's some buses actually at the depot at, at during the midday and they are charging uh, quite a bit here during the midday to be able to use, you know, all that um, all that kilowattage, basically uh, kilowatt hours, I should say, under this blue line to be as, you know, as to keep that like peak as low as possible and not go over the 1.9 megawatt that we have right here. Um, I also want to add, if we go back to what I talked about before about derating chargers, right? So none of these chargers are permanently derated. So these are 150 kilowatt chargers. So they could be charging between zero and 150 kilowatt at all time. So um, any charger, right, could maybe be going at full power right here because there's less buses connected versus in the middle of the night, probably all buses will be there at one point when no, no more routes all run. Um, and then the charging will probably be much lower per charger than 150 kilowatts. So we don't have a huge spike right here or here as we have with the red. Now, um, this is the same um, in summer. And um, I'm just showing you this so you know we can be a little bit more specific because we can see that actually the peak um, is higher, the unmanaged peak. It's at um, 11 megawatt. And even the managed peak is a little higher at 2.2 megawatt. Of course, you know, it'd be nice to stay in the winter and have that lower, but really, um, you know, if you're looking at depot design, you're gonna wanna take um, the time of year that has the higher demands. So um, you can design for that. Um, and there's certain, certain little differences, um, you know, again, between the different seasons. But if you look at that now, right, like what does that mean in this case? So if we go back to our questions that I asked before, on the capital expense side, right, like what is the minimum number of chargers required to charge buses for these routes? So if we do unmanaged charging, it'd be 105, right? Like you just plug it in and walk away. Um, and actually, with this modeling that we just did, that I just showed you right here, we can actually see that um, it's only 89 charges that are necessary. So these, um, what is that, 16 chargers less required, these are some savings right there that are very tangible on the capital side. Um, so multiply that by whatever the charger costs. Um, and again, it's 150 kilowatt. In this case, um, in this case, a, um, you know, non manufacturer specific chargers. There's multiple charger companies that will supply a 150 kilowatt charger. The point here is with smart charging, you only need, um, you know, 10% less about. And then if we look at the maximum load um, at, at any time here, we just talked about that. It's about 11 megawatt on unmanaged. And sm with smart charging, it's only 2.2. So now that is, um, you know, how much is that? 20%, um, less than 20%. Um, so assuming, you know, if we want to put a dollar value on that, it will depend how much a utility would um, charge for this upgrade to 11 megawatt, which is a lot of power. 
Um, my guess would be that it's not even a question of price, but more a question of actually getting that power and the timeline for that, which can be completely avoided if you look at smart charging, given that the there's more than five megawatt available right now, no upgrade is needed. So if there was funding for buses and chargers tomorrow, you know, these could be charging right then and there from a, you know, from a charging, charging perspective, from an infrastructure perspective. Um, right, and then if you look at the operational expenses, so with unmanaged charging, it would actually be between here 150 and $185,000 per month, which is an exorbitant amount of, uh, amount of um, dollar. At the same time, these are 150 buses, right? This is a big operation. This is still a lot of money. Obviously, it's over a million dollars um, a year. And with managed charging, you know, that could be brought down to between 60 and 70, basically, between 60 and $70,000 per month. So less than half. Um, so why I personally love, um, you know, doing this so much is because it gives a fleet operator very clear agency over what makes sense for them. So while I'm, as you can see, a big fan of smart charging, right? It The question is like, does it make sense, right? From a dollar value perspective. And in this case, we can see, yes, it does very much so. You know, throw on, um, you know, whatever the smart charging system costs, which is not as much as um, the difference to the unmanaged charging cost, you know, and you still save a lot of money. Now, very quickly, why that is, because I'm wondering, um, I want to be crystal clear on that, right? The amount that is charged is still the same, right? Like, so the amount of charging that happens between the red and um, the blue is still the same, but we are avoiding a lot of these really expensive demand charges. And looking really quickly at what that actually means, right? So, okay, here we go. So this might be something that is not new for, for many people, but I want to very quickly hit on it, right? So there is really two um, parts to an electricity bill. This is residential as well, right? If I personally look at my electricity bill, I can see that too. There's the electricity consumption, right? Like how much have I been consuming? And that's charged in dollars by a kilowatt hour. So the more I, I uh, consume, you know, the more expensive it is. Easy enough, like a water bill, basically. In Manitoba, because you all have a lot of hydro, um, that's actually really cheap. Uh, it's 4.5 kilo uh, cents per kilowatt hour. This is, of course, the commercial tariff, right? Um, and it's the total energy during a billing cycle, usually a month, right? Now, the second part are the demand charges. And the demand charges are uh, determined by looking at the highest peak um, occurring during any 15 minute period of a billing cycle. So these spikes that we have looked at, these red spikes are the ones that determine the demand charges. And then in this case, the blue also, wherever it is, right? The managed charging would also determine the demand charges. The difference of course is that with smart charging, these um, spikes or like the, the high is much lower. And this is actually charged in dollar per kilowatt. So it's not about the amount consumed. It really is just how high are these spikes. And that can be as high as $12 per kilowatt. That really depends where you're at. Um, but it can really, really throw a wrench in any calculation that says that electric vehicles are lower, you know, have a lower total cost of ownership, which is true than um, gas-powered or diesel-powered vehicles. Um, that is all true, but these demand charges can really alter that ca um, calculation in either way. And we have an example here, for example, for electricity bill. It's not, it's not unusual to have the demand charges make up um, you know, three quarters of an electricity bill. And so these are really what we can address with smart charging. And this is really why in the Winnipeg Transit example, we really we're able to lower this electricity bill by less than half by just cutting the demand charges, even though the energy or electricity consumed here, the light blue, still the same, but it's just not as big of a part of the electricity bill. 
All right. Um, we're almost there. Um, before I let you all go, I would like to you know, give you a little bit more tangible um, recommendations that we at the Mobility House have gathered from our um, experience working with different electric fleets, again, such as transit, such as school, such as um, national postal services, such as commercial fleets, and so on and so on, right? Like, what should you be thinking about right now? Uh, what's the tangible, you know, takeaway here? Now, we already talked about the fact that, you know, the charging simulation, or I, I guess I showed you that charging simulation can provide really valuable insights, but what, which insights could you be thinking about? Which insights could you be interested in at which state of the, um, of the electrification process? And I have split this up here in the electrification planning. These are oftentimes these feasibility studies that are often done um, with different consultants um, that are out there that have specialized in this, right? Then after that, usually the facility gets designed, um, the hardware gets selected, right? And then, you know, the whole thing is in operations, right? And so what, what would make sense to look at here? Now, the fleets that we have worked with um, have noticed that in the electrification planning stage, right? No vehicles already on the road. It actually makes sense to just look at which routes can be electrified first for the maximum emission reduction benefit or the lowest operational cost. This depends a little bit if there is a mandate to lower emission reductions um, or you know, if there is really what the, what the, what the uh, considerations are here. So it's good to know this, right? To be able to report on that. Um, there's also sometimes carbon credits um, that can be uh, generated, and that would also be important to know, you know, how many can I generate, how much money will that, will that make me? Another question would be, which vehicle models should I be looking at? Which vehicle models are most suitable? And so what we would recommend here is really an analysis of the routes to determine the electrification feasibility, which routes, you know, can be done with electric vehicles right now. Um, and so which routes should I be starting with? Um, what's the best case scenario for charging? What's the worst case scenario for charging? You know, and which vehicle models would be, you know, in the ballpark here um, to be considered? If we look at the next phase, right? Let's say you have the feasibility done. Now you're getting into the design of the charging depot. Of course, you know, again, vehicles are purchased and all that. We're just the charging company. So I look at charging um, and that's what this whole process is here about. So the question, first question would be, what are the power requirements for charging at the site? And so that is really about the peak load, right? Like what will the peak load be for charging? How much power do I need for my utility? Is it five megawatts? Is it two megawatts? Is it 11 megawatts? That is something that should be de uh, determined at this stage because the design will need to take that into consideration um, to design the power equipment accordingly. So it's really important to look at charging, managed and unmanaged at the site to determine how much power is actually needed. Um, you know, and again, also another question with the power um, uh, upgrade and power needed on the site would be, does it make sense to get energy storage for the site to, either um, get the resilience or um, to navigate the uh, utility tariff as into a lower um, electricity cost. Um, does it make sense to have solar on the site? And all this can be addressed by um, also running an optimization that includes you know, the peak load, but then also a cost benefit analysis of battery energy storage and PV because there is a certain resilience aspect of it, of course, for energy storage um, and, and PV and to some extent as well. But there's also a dollar value behind that, right? Like how much will that actually save? How much, what is the benefit of that? And how much will it cost as well? And that can be assessed um, ahead of time. You know, for the third phase, the hardware selection, this is very easy. Um, the question would just be, you know, looking at the routes, how much charging power is required per vehicle, um, how many charges are required, and um, how do different charger manufacturers compare? 
So what I would recommend is to have a analysis run that, um, well, really with the input of any previous analysis that looks at the routes can compare how charging would look like with different charger models. Um, and then, you know, design any site or the selection of hardware accordingly with that particular power rating of the chargers and that um, amount of chargers as well. And this, I should say, we, we looked at an example of 150 kilowatt chargers at one site, really across one site. But of course, you know, it might be that you want 150 kilowatt chargers and a couple of 450 kilowatt chargers, bigger pantographs, for example, for transit, but maybe also a couple of 50 kilowatt chargers, right? So there might be a mix of this and it's worth it to assess that ahead of time and know what that mix should be to really not overbuild, but of course also not underbuild, make sure that there's enough charging power at the site uh, for the vehicles. And finally, you know, for the operations piece, um, I have seen many fleets run the simulation ahead of time to see what the expected um, electricity cost should be per month. And that's very similar to uh, this uh, quick study with it uh, for Winnipeg Transit. You know, how much, how much will it cost? How much will it cost without smart charging? Which smart charging to inform any purchasing decisions on a system? I want to also add that what is another interesting piece to look at at this time would be a VGI, VGI analysis, which is, uh, stands for um, vehicle grid integration. So really the question would be what are the, um, an assessment would be what, what are the um, uh, potential earnings from participating in DER um, in different events from the utility where they basically pay you to lower um, lower your charging at certain times. Um, it might make sense to benefit from that. Uh, it might make sense to participate in that from a um, dollar value amount. It might not. And that is something that might, might make sense to assess. This will become more and more important in the future as more and more utilities will actually um, have more and more of these events where they pay customers to charge or not charge at certain times. And the last part here would be a vehicle to X viability assessment. So that really stands for vehicle to whatever, um, let's call it vehicle to grid um, viability assessment. Vehicle to grid is at the moment um, not commercially something that is um, at the large scale rolled out. It will become more and more important in the future that we can also discharge vehicles back into the grid and sell that electricity, right? And it might be of interest if my charging site would actually um, be a good site to, to participate in the pilot programs coming up there, or even maybe in 10 years, you know, would be a good site. There are certain amounts that go into that. One would be, of course, you know, how the utility would compensate for that. Another one would really be, are these vehicles actually at the depot often enough to discharge to the grid, right? Like, are they actually there? Otherwise, they can't do that. So that's something to be um, potentially um, looking at. And that is almost all from me. Um, I want to finish off really quickly by giving you two more examples, right? One would be Stockton Unified School District. That is a school district um, in California that we have worked with to do exactly everything that we just basically talked about. Um, they have a mix of AC and DC charges, which, which makes it very interesting. And um, doing simulation ahead of time has showed them that they can save half a million dollars over five years on the utility tariff. That informed very much the strategy for them to procure a smart charging system or not. Um, another question here would be, um, they also looked at, or another question that they had wanted answered was they looked at energy storage viability, um, PV, viability and also in general, you know, like a v, uh, vehicle to grid um, roadmap in the future, um, you know, just being informed about that. Um, yeah. And another um, example here is a transit authority. Um, 
This one is an interesting case because their savings had also been very high. Now, this is a little bit different um, because it is um, in California as well. And in California, there's a time of use rate. So electricity costs different at different times of day. Um, with that, a uh, simulation was able to show that they could save half a million dollars per year on their electricity tariff. Um, and so that was also very important information as in like how to plan out this electrification, right? And again, does smart charging make sense for them? So I wanna leave you with these two examples. Um, and um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, so much for joining me today to discuss um, how smart charging can help to mitigate demand charges and lower the peak demand to um, avoid grid upgrades. I'm gonna stick around for a little bit longer um, in case you have any questions. Yeah, it's great. Thanks so much. Appreciate uh, your time today and uh, very, very interesting presentation. And a question I have for you, just uh, if any of the people out on the webinar have questions, please feel to submit them using the Q&A feature and uh, we'll get to them uh, right away. Um, in Manitoba, we have demand, peak demand charges, right? Uh, what's to say that in the future we don't go, we go to time of use hmm. sort of a model in, in a simulation is it possible to look at both to kind of hedge your bet if the rate structure changes in the future that your design is still going to um it's still going to be the most efficient way to charge a fleet under uh, a, a change in, in charge fees yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's kind of a two part question and I'll answer it in two parts. Um, so you asked what determines if there's a time of use tariff or not, right? Mm -hmm. And that is mostly determined by the type of renewable energy that we have in the system. The reason why we have time of use rates in many, I'll say warmer climates is because of the, of the um, amount of solar in the grid, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, Obviously, the sun doesn't shine um, after, I don't know, 7 p.m. at night or something like that. But that's exactly when everybody comes home and starts, you know, turning on the AC, starts cooking, starts turning on the TV, things like that, right? And so what utilities in these um, in these areas with more solars are trying to do is trying to shift, right, the uh, consumption more towards the night, um, or towards the time of day where um, there is a lot of solar and um, people are not having usually high consumption. Maybe that'd be like right, the middle of the day um, and when people are at work, things like that, right? Given the fact that Manitoba has so much um, hydro, that is probably the reason why you don't have time of use right now. However, um, that might change, right? We don't know what's gonna happen, uh, which other renewables are coming on the grid here soon. Um, wind is actually another one that is fluctuates very much depending on the time of day. Wind is actually um, traditionally stronger at night than during the day. So who knows, maybe in the future, um, your utility will want to incentivize you to use more at night and then you will get a time of use tariff. Okay. Now, to, sorry, your your question was also to, if that can be um, looked at in the in the simulation. Did I get that right? Yeah, like a parallel simulation. If we today it's demand charges, this is the way the system will look. But if we were to change it to a time of use, mm -hmm. this is what the this is what it's going to look like. Is that but is that even possible? Yeah, that should be possible. Um, usually when, how the mobility house goes about it, when we look at demand charges or time of use really, we look at a real utility tariff, right? So we look at like, how does this utility tariff inform the charging strategy? So what we could of course do is, um, you know, take a, a standard, like a generalized time of use tariff and uh, compare that, right? Mm -hmm. With if that would like kick in, right? How would charging look like? How much roundabout would it cost? Um, that of course will, will depend on how much actually the utility will punish for charging in peak times. 
and, and, and reward for off-peak times. But yeah, that is definitely a contrast and comparison that one could, could, could look at to be prepared in case it does change. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, one of the speakers at our conference coming up in October, uh, Sel, uh, Salvador Lamas from uh, AC Transit in Oakland, Yep. they are actually looking at uh, using their buses as mobile power uh, sources for buildings when the power is out in California. And they're looking at actually having the bus drive over to a building and uh, plug into the building to provide backup and, and emergency power. So they're kind of a unique, um, you know, you, you talk about uh, vehicle to grid, they're actually going to bring the so-called grid to the building that needs power. So, you know, a very, very unique uh, use of a zero emissions vehicle. They're actually looking at uh, using the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to do that so that they can manufacture their own electricity using hydrogen and then send it off to the building. So really, really cool stuff. Yeah, I agree. That's a that's a really interesting project. And um, they're actually using the new flyer vehicles for this. Yeah. And um, they are going to be using uh, one of our tools to discharge the bus as well. OK. Um, and it's going to be powering. Um, so Salvador will be better positioned to answer this. but. Uh, I believe it's going to be powering a public library in case mm -hmm. of any outages, which happen a lot in California. So there is a place where people can come to to have power, a, pu a public place. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So we have a question come across. Can you share more about the implication of smart charging on infrastructure planning? Yeah, um, of course. So I think you know, the overarching topic here would be really looking at the peak demand and um, going from there to determine how much power is actually needed on the size and then right sizing the equipment. Um, you know, in this case with Winnipeg Transit, we determined that with smart charging, they would need about 2.2 megawatt um, and uh, at this site, right? So any EPC that builds this out for them, right? Would not need to put in more equipment to go up to those 11 megawatts. Um, yeah, so that, that, that would be the important part there. Of course, also if we talk infrastructure planning a little bit more you know, specific on the chargers, it also um, would determine, you know, the simulation would also determine which charges you need, which power rating, how many chargers, things like that. So it can, like this whole simulation, these whole simulations can really be a tool to determine early on, right? How much how much do you need of everything? Basically of power, of chargers, right? Um, maybe even of vehicles, which routes are you gonna electrify? So it can be really a early, early step to go about this whole electrification efficiently and um, in a cost conscious way as well. Okay. So what kind of data, like let's say that there was a fleet owner out there that is interested in, in having an analysis done, what kind of information is required by a company like yours in order to do a simulation um, that would give them some results back to give them an indication of what infrastructure might look like as they build out their fleet and what their monthly power charges are going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. So it will depend on what the question is that needs to be answered. Um, I like to think of these simulations as a equation that we can solve for whichever variable, right? And that will, of course, depend on which variables we already have. So what I mean with that, for example, is if you already know which charges you're going to get, because maybe you've already procured them, or if you already know which vehicles you're going to get, right, then that's an input, um, not something that we would be solving for. Mm -hmm. So in this case, let's say, you know, vehicles are already procured or RFP is out um, and they're specified, uh, charges are already procured, then these would be really important inputs. Um, another important input would be, of course, which utility tariff that specific site is on or will be on, oftentimes that changes depending on the consumption, which will of course go up as we charge vehicles now. Um, and then another input would be, is, there's any, is there already a um, constraint on site, mm -hmm. um, right? Like, is there already a hard limit on site that we are trying to work around? Um, or, you know, how far, it will inform showing like how far up do we have to go over this um, hard limit, right? Another input would be the schedules if they're available 
um, the departure times, um, the arrival times, the mileage of the different vehicles, and then anything else that affects um, the uh, fleet. There's you know, a couple other things that could be there depending on the complexity that we wanna go into. Um, yeah, but these are the most standard information that would be required. Okay, and then on top of that, you'd have to know what your other building loads are and those kinds of things that are not connected to the fleet because that all adds to the peak, right? Yes, that's right, if it's on the same service. And yep. so that will depend on the application. Oftentimes in transits, we see them having their own service. But if we're talking more commercial fleet, maybe more medium duty, um, almost every time there is something else there that we need to take into consideration because, you know, we don't want to look at it isolated and then have something else and, you know, completely, um, we have completely uh, screw our results. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. If there is a last one out there, uh, please submit it. But uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's, as you build out a fleet, you, you know, like I said earlier at the beginning here is your first vehicle isn't really a, you buy a charger, you charge the vehicle, you use the vehicle, everything's great. But it's when you start to, to build the fleet out that all of a sudden, all of the considerations in your simulation are, are things that have to be addressed. So that's, uh, you know, and also on route charging, there might be some applications where the potential is, is that the vehicles at some point during the day can get to a point where you can blast them and, and bring the charge level up. Uh, to a point where they don't need as much charge at night, right? So, and yep. reduce the peak that way. So there's all kinds of creative ways of of uh, looking at charging as, a, as an entire strategy based on the use of your vehicles. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. Honest. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks for the presentation. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach to uh, Anna Maria. Uh, her contact information is on the screen here. I'll have this webinar posted on our website uh, in the next uh, couple of days. And uh, yeah, like I said earlier, if you have other uh, subjects that you'd like to see a webinar uh, built around, please feel free to reach out. I'd uh, appreciate uh, your input so that we can make these as, uh, as um, impactful as we possibly can on our sector. So uh, thanks for your time today. And uh, thanks again, Anna Maria. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank All you, right. everybody. All right. Have a great day.